Let's, we'll start from the current slide, even though we're not quite at this place yet. Uh, but I did want to go over, I thought it was going to start there. We go. Everything's acting rather strange this morning. Maybe it's not acting. Okay. Ah, there we go. All right. Uh, do know that coming up two weeks from today on the Birmingham West Campus, uh, Building B, the academic building, um, and all up and down that long hallway there, from 9.30 to 11.30, they'll have tables for a whole bunch of colleges and universities in Alabama and the Southeast. Uh, so lots of uh, places to be there. This is our College Transfer Fair Day. Okay. Then on Thursday, two weeks from tomorrow, on this campus, it will be in this building. They say in the campus cafeteria. I doubt if it will be in the cafeteria. I think they mean the the faculty staff dining room, which is just next door to the cafeteria. Uh, I don't think any faculty or staff eat in there anymore, uh, but it's a big, you know, a decent sized space, has lots of tables, and uh, I imagine that's where it'll be. Now, if they can't get everybody in there, they may spill over into the cafeteria or out into the hallway or somewhere there. Uh, they'll have it Thursday, 9.30, that's the 13th of February, 9.30 to 11.30. Same schools will be invited. I don't know how many will show for either day. Well, this is one I want y'all to seriously consider. Uh, it's the summer research program for the Center for Power Optimization of Electrothermal Systems, POETS, okay? They're looking to recruit minority engineering students to work at three of the institutions, University of Illinois, University of Arkansas, or Howard University. Ten-week internship program Exposes undergraduate programs to academic research in the fields of mechanical, electrical, and material engineering. Students are paid. You don't pay. You are paid $5,000 stipend just to go. What a deal. Okay? And you receive free housing, which usually includes a meal plan, so free food, and they'll pay your airfare there and back once. Okay? Uh, so any other time you want to come home, that's on your, from your five thousand dollars stipend, uh, whatever. I don't care. Okay, but probably a good idea to spend as much time there as possible. You'll see what four-year schools are like. It's just an incredible opportunity. The application deadline is coming up February fifteenth. I have a long email with lots of information in it, lots of websites, email addresses, those kind of things, and then there's this little. Uh, brochure that didn't print very well on this side, uh, but it does have a lot of information on the inside. Uh, interesting. They say here the final application deadline is February 17th. I was wondering about that because the 15th of February, I believe, is on a weekend. So they must have extended it to the next Monday. Okay. But they say 15th on this one, 17th on that one. Get it in early. Make sure you're on time. Uh, there are probably plenty of other of those research opportunities out there. Uh, there's lots of schools have them. They're sponsored by National Science Foundation. They really, I think I've said this before, the U.S. needs engineers. Big time. Okay? There's just loads of opportunity for engineering, we're having to import engineers from India and China and other places. We want to grow our own engineers. Okay, so uh, please uh, stay with it, folks, and uh, take advantage of these opportunities. They can only help. Okay, now, the reason I said we're not here yet, oh, any questions or anything we've covered so far? All right. The reason I said we're not here yet in 2.4, we had one more example to do in 2.3, but it wasn't on the 2.3 PowerPoints, so I thought, let me go on and get the 2.4 PowerPoints open. But, at least in the beginning, there weren't very many with very much white space, so that's why I'm using this one. It says, find the limit where, let me get my pen set up. All right, 
the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 4x over x, I think it is. I can't write. Okay. Good deal. Now, now I'm beginning to wish I had still open the 2.3, even though this wasn't on there, because in 2.3, if you go back one page from this one, you'll see there is a limit listed here for limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. Anyone remember what that one was? Sine x over x? That was 1. This isn't sine x over x. This is sine x, uh, 4x over x. Okay? Now, can't change the 4x to an x, but we could change the x to a 4x, couldn't we? By doing what? Multiply top and bottom by 4. Excellent. Okay? Now, if you still don't think that applies, you can rename 4x and make it you or me or, no, I mean, uh, y or any other thing that you want. And then you'd have sine u over u, sine y over y, whatever. We know the limit of that. What is that? This limit here. Does someone say? One. Exactly. So this would then be 4 times 1. 4. There's the limit. Okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> Just look down at the page and they had a 1 half. I said impossible. No. On the wrong page. Okay. 4 is the answer. All right. Uh, they have a little technology blurb at the bottom um, that talks about f of x sine, uh, tan x over x and g of x sine 4x over x. We just did that one. Uh, and if you do the that on the graphing calculator, that's what they're, they're talking about there. Um, again, you can't always trust them because the way they do their approximations, uh, sometimes they'll say it doesn't have an answer when it does. Other times they'll say it has an answer when it doesn't. So be careful. They called them technology pitfalls before. This one just says technology. So that finishes 2.3. Any questions on 2.3? Okay. Again, I'll go through all the homework exercises here, though I'm sure you've already done all these. Uh, any of the odds 5 through 17, they're all at Calc Chat. Uh, five, 5's at Calc View. 19 to, or 21, they're both at Calc Chat. 21's at Calc View. Any of the odds 23 to 35, they're all at Calc Chat. 25's at Calc View. 37 or 39, they're both at Calc Chat. 39's at Calc View. Any of the odds 41 to 43, all at Calc Chat. 41's at Calc View. Uh, any of the odds 47 to 61, they're all at Calc Chat. 53 is at Calc View. Any of the odds 63 to 75, they're all at Calc Chat. 65 is at Calc View. Any of the odds 77 to 85, they're all at Calc Chat. 77 is at Calc View. Uh, 87 to 93, they're all at Calc Chat. 87 is at Calc View. That's the. No, okay. Okay. 95 should be at Calc Chat. Either 97 or 99 should be at Calc Chat. You can look into doing 101 if you'd like. That uh, should be at Calc Chat. 103 is a writing exercise. You can look at that if you'd like. That should be at Calc Chat. Um, 105 should be at Calc Chat. That's a sort of a physics type problem. Uh, and what you gain from that, you use then in 107, and that should be at Calc Chat. 
Then they have a finding functions, 109, that should be a couch chat. They have a bunch of proofs, 111 through 115, they should all be at couch chat. You can think about doing 117 if you'd like, that should be at couch chat. There's true false, 119 to 123, you can do those if you'd like, they should be at couch chat. 125 is another proof, at, and it should be at couch chat. Uh, there's graphical reasoning 127, and that should be a couch chat. All right. Any questions? 2.3. All right. Let me back up one slide here then, and this is where the slides actually begins. Still in Chapter 2, Limits and Their Properties. 2.4 is now continuity and one-sided limits. Okay? Objectives here are... Determine continuity at a point and continuity on an open interval. Okay? We'll determine one sided limits and continuity on a closed interval. Anyone know the difference in open and closed intervals? Okay, that's one way to think of it. A interval is the unit that the line stops exactly on that. Yeah, exactly. The, and that's the same thing I think he was saying. A, an open interval does not include the endpoints of that interval. Everything up to those, it does include, but not the endpoint. Closed interval includes the endpoint. So yeah, both of you are saying that in another way, probably better than I do. Okay? We'll use properties of continuity, okay? And we'll under, you will understand and use the intermediate value theorem which is one of the sort of classic theorems in calculus, okay? So we'll start with continuity at a point and on open intervals, not counting endpoints. Okay, in mathematics, the term continuous has much the same meaning that it does in everyday usage, okay? There's a little bit of a... Another way you can think of it, uh, we'll get to it in just a minute. Informally, to say that a function f is continuous at some point c, x equals c, means that there is no interruption in the graph of f at c. If you're coming in towards c and the graph's going here, there's no break. Excuse me. Oh! Excuse me. Thank you. I'll make sure y'all will wait and from what it would be coming in from the right. There is no break. So that means it's continuous at the point C. That is, the graph is unbroken at C, which is what I just was saying, and there are no holes, jumps, gaps, or anything else at C. That whatever is coming in on the left, coming in from the right, no holes, no jumps, no gaps, no discontinuities, okay? There, everything is Continuous. Okay, I can't think of another way to say it. So this figure, 2.26, identifies three values of x at which the graph of f is not continuous. All of the other points on the interval a to b, the graph, and notice what kind of interval is this? Open interval, illustrated by the parentheses. Brackets means closed interval, parentheses open interval. This means A is not included in the interval, B is not included, but everything up to those are. Okay? The graph of F is, okay, at other points, the graph is, F is uninterrupted and is continuous. Okay? But here's the first of those. F of C is just not even defined. Okay? Now, an example of that that we've had earlier. When you had f of x was a polynomial function divided by another po polynomial function, but they have a common factor, but that factor would be x equals c, so x minus c would be that factor, but it's, since it's in the denominator, not defined that, okay? 
everywhere else it would be defined. Because it's in the numerator as well, you can capsule it out, but you still can't put it there. So that would be one place that f of c is not defined, uh, where it's discontinuous, where f of c is just not even defined. Now here's another one, okay? f of c is defined right there, you know, but coming in from the left is approaching that value f of c, but coming from the right is approaching a completely different value f of c, okay? So even though it's defined here, it's not the same from the left and right, so therefore the limit at x equals c doesn't exist. Even though the value exists, the limit doesn't because it has to be from both sides. Okay? And the other place where it doesn't exist, okay, now why you would have this, I don't know. I can't think of a practical situation where this would be the case, but here you have the function and it's approaching f of c here from the left and approaching f of c from the right but at x equals c the value is down here okay obviously not continuous because it goes here shoot, shoot, and back up again not continuous this one is not defined at f of c these two it is okay but it's not continuous there because it's not defined here is defined at f of c but from the left, that's the limit. From the right, it's not. So therefore, the limit doesn't exist at x equals c. So that's approaching c. Here, the function is defined, but it's a value that's neither from the left or the right. It's a different value at c. So this is discontinuous at c. Obviously, way discontinuous at c. This one's discontinuous because there's no value there. Here, there's a value for f of c, but it's not uh, the limit for it's the limit from one side, but not the other. Here, there's a value there, but it's neither the limit. That value is neither the limit from the left or the right. Okay? So those are three conditions exist for which the graph f is not continuous. Okay. Now, this one and this one, by one small change, you could make it continuous. Here, f of c is not defined, so what you do is define it to be that value, okay? Uh, even though your function form doesn't work, you can say, but, just like f of c is down here, just say f of c is up here, okay? This one, there's no way you'll ever be able to overcome that discontinuity. That is what they call a jump discontinuity. This one, you could redefine the f of c to be from there to be there, now it's continuous. That was actually, you don't need it. How do we know these are open intervals? The circles are here, not uh, solid dots, the circles at the end. Okay. Now, so that figure appeared, and the discontinuity of x equals c can be destroyed by anyone, the uh, continuity can be destroyed by any one of these conditions. First, the function not being defined at x equals c. If it's not defined there, no way it's going to be continuous there. The limit does exist, does not exist at, at x equals c. In other words, the limit exists from one direction, but not from the other direction. Uh, so therefore, the limit doesn't exist, uh, but even though the value does exist at x equals f of c does exist. Here, it doesn't even exist at x equals c. And the third one is the limit of f exists at x equals c, but it's not equal to f of c. That's that weird one that f of c was to find something else. If none of those three conditions is true, then the function f is called continuous at c. As indicated in the following important definition below. Okay? Continuity at a point. A function f of is continuous at C when one when these three conditions are met. Number one, it has to be defined at C. If it's not, it can't be continuous there. Okay? Number two, the limit as X approaches C of F of X exists, and that implies both from the left and the right. So it has to be defined and the limit must exist. And the third one is 
that the limit is x approaches c of f of x is f of c. So you can't have that in this off, just completely out of place. So it has to be defined, the limit has to exist, and the limit must be f of c. Okay. So, continuity on an open interval. A function is continuous on an open interval a to b, parentheses around those, when the function is continuous at each point in the interval. Now, there's an infinite number of points in the interval. You can't test them all, but you can just basically tell by the function uh, definition whether it's uh, continuous or not. The function it, that is continuous on the entire real number line from negative infinity to positive infinity is called to be continuous everywhere. Everywhere continuous, that's in backwards. Continuous everywhere. However you want to say it. Okay. Any questions so far? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Consider an open interval I that contains some real number C. Okay. If a function F is defined on I, except possibly at C, and F is not continuous at C, okay, then F is said to have a discontinuity of C. So if it's not continuous, it has a discontinuity somewhere, and if that's the point, it has a discontinuity of C. Discontinuities fall into two categories. This is what I was alluding to earlier. One is a removable discontinuity by making a new value there, or a non-removable, remo removable, there ain't no way you could ever make it continuous. Okay? Discontinuity at C is called removable when F can be made continuous by appropriately defining or redefining F of C. I just said that and it wasn't defined at C, define it there. Just out of blue. But we want that to have that there. Or when it's defined to be something completely different, redefine it and say, no, we want it up here. Okay? That would be uh, a removable discontinuity. Something like this. No way you can remove that discontinuity. So, for instance, the functions that we showed before, okay, if you, this is removable because you can define f of c to be that value right there. Whatever that happens to be, define it to be that. Even though your, your uh, functional expression was not defined there, you can go back and say, but we want f of c to be that value. This one's not removable. You have to, nothing you can define that f of c to be to make that. Never the plain to me that it's just not ever going to happen. Okay? This one, even though it was defined down here, the limit existed, but f of c wasn't the same as the limit of f of c. Redefine it. Just say, nope, we don't want it to be there anymore. We want it to be here. Now it's continuous. So that is removable. All right, so let's discuss the continuity of each of these functions. What about f of x here? 1 over x. Is it continuous or not? At all values of x. No, why not? Or would it not be continuous? x equals 0. Well, could you remove that? Say again? How? Let's think about what f of 1 over x looks like. In the right-hand quadrant, upper right, it goes like that, right? What does it do on the left side? Like that. Because 1 over a negative number is going to be negative. 1 over a positive number is going to be positive. The closer you get to 0, the bigger that one is, and the bigger this one is, there ain't no way, no way you'll ever do it. Unless you wrap it all the way around infinity and come up no. Okay. Now, how about this one? So wait, that one was non-removable? Yeah, this is discontinuous and non-removable. Okay, you see why? Okay. How about G? Or E, which is G of X. Is it continuous? Is it continuous? 
yes. Okay. Right. Oops! Not defined there. Okay. However, that is in the terminal form. Is there some way we could? Uh, what would happen? What What can we do to that to see what it is everywhere except x equal one? Remember that trick. Let's see, F word? Oh, a factor. Okay, well, how does that factor? X plus 1 times X minus 1. Is that what I heard? Say yes. Okay, over X minus 1. Then what can you do? Ha, ha, ha. At X equal 1, G of X is approaching, has a limit of what? Say again? Really? As X is approaching Y. How level done? Oh. Two. two. Okay, one plus one is two. Okay? So, what we do, this is not continuous to X equal one, but is it removable? Or not? Why not? There is a limit. It's two, right? You just told me that, right? So let's redefine x g of one just to be two. Okay? How you would do this would say g of x is equal to x squared minus one over x minus one for all x is not equal to one. It's equal to 2 for all x is equal to 1, or when x is equal to 1. You filled in the hole. This one had a hole in the graph, and that's all it had. It didn't have a discharge, you know, a brokenness there. It was, the limit was 2, whichever way you went, okay? So if you just redefine it, x equal 1 to be 2, you got it. You filled in the hole. It's now a removable discontinuity. How about H? Oh my. That's a middle point. Where would be your only problem child possibly? Polynomial functions are defined where? All real numbers. Everywhere, yes. This one? Okay. Number one is discontinuous. It says discuss the continuity of these functions. It's discontinuous at one. Not even defined at one. Okay. But is it removable or not? Well, if you did this little trick, this was called, what did we call that? Uh, what we did was factor mode. Maybe it's just, you know, simplifying the factor, something like that. But anyway, this shows that the limit as x approaches 1, which is where it's discontinuous, the limit of that is 2. So therefore, since it has a limit from both directions, okay, but it's discontinuous at x equals 1, just redefine it at, it's, it's that for any value x not equal to 1. But to define it at x equal 1, this is all over value of 2. So that means it's approaching 2 from this direction, approaching 2 from this direction, but it has a hole there, so we'll just fill in the hole with that value. And it'll be continuous. That looks like this one. The hole is at x equal, two, uh, x equal 1, but this value is f of 2. If we just define that to be right there, even though it's not defined by your function value, just make it a piecewise defined. This everywhere else, here and here, not that this is the same graph, uh, but it's not defined there, so redefine. And that's what we did here. We redefined to be the value to be 2 when x equal 1. Because it wasn't defined to x equal 1. 
All right. Does that answer the question? Okay. Now, this what about polynomial functions? Where are those defined? Everywhere. Okay? How about exponential functions? Where are those defined? Everywhere. Okay? So, you would think you wouldn't have a problem here, <laughs> except these are two different functions. And this is the one for all x is less than or equal to 0. And so, at x equals 0, what would that be? One. Okay. Now, this is for all x's greater than zero. But let's just imagine, what would that be at zero? Say again? Okay. E to the one, e to the zero is zero, right? Any base raised to the zero power is? Oh, it's one, isn't it? And this is just a base, okay? Yeah, so that's one. Hey, we have no problem. Because this one is a line, slope of 1, going up to 1 as x approaches 0. This is an exponential function that would have been at 1, but it goes up pretty rapidly there. Yeah, even though it's jacket there, it still continues there. No problem. Because the limit of this one, as x approaches 0, even though it's not defined at 0, is 1. That is one, so yeah, we have no problem. That's continuous on its own line. How about y is equal to sine x? Another transcendental function. What about that? Is it continuous or discontinuous? Is it discontinuous? Say again? Continuous. Sine and cosine continuous everywhere. How about tangent? No! All your half pies. Cool, there. Like that. Okay, how about potential? No, uh, all your whole pies. They're like this, okay? And secret? Say again? Continuous or discontinuous? Oh, guess what? Secret is 1 over. Oh, uh, that is how it is. Cosine. Now, is cosine ever zero? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you have a bunch of places that you have to be worried about. And what are those places? Your half pies. Just like tangent is sine over cosine. Anytime you got cosine in the denominator, you don't have a bunch of zeros there. So those are the half pies. How about cosecant? Continuous or discontinuous? Say again? Continuous. What is cosecant? How do we define it? Say again? Discontinuous because it's one over sine. Sine has a bunch of zeros where? At the whole pies. Okay? So yeah. Sine and cosine continuous everywhere. All, you, all four of the others is trig function. Not. You think about what your tangents go like this. Like this, definitely discontinuous with this half pi. Cotangent, same way, just going in the opposite direction. Uh, discontinuous at the whole pi. The, remember how the secrets look? Like this, and then like this, and then like this. You think that's continuous, folks? Ew. Nowhere close. And those secrets, same thing on the chip. Okay. So, yeah. Those were extra, but no extra charge. Okay. So, domain of F for that first one is all non-zero real numbers. <laughs> non-zero. So, there's your problem, child. What is it doing at x equals zero? Well, it's not defined there. Okay? And from theorem 2.3, we conclude it is continuous at every x value in its domain, but zero is not in the domain. Okay? Now, is this a repeat? I think it is, or is this is a new theorem, is it? No, this is previous, okay? Uh, 
why are they putting this in here? This isn't a polynomial function, okay? Oh, here's the reason. Okay, if p was a polynomial function, c is a real number, this continues everywhere. The limit is x of p of x is x plus z is equal to p of c. Polynomials continues everywhere. But if r is a rational function, which f is, then given by r of x is equal to p of x over q of x. Our f was 1 is your p of x, x is your q of x. And c is a real number such that f of c is not equal to, I mean, q of c is not equal to 0, but at x equals 0, it is 0, okay? Because it's x, okay? Then, this is that, but it's only where q of c is not 0, and q of c is x, because if it was 0, that's 0 at 0, okay? So the limit uh, does not exist there, okay? Well, yeah. Limit does not exist there. So at x equals zero, hey. Why they just showed positive value, they should have gone off. Here is your positive side of f of x, here is your negative side of f of x. Those two ever don't meet? No, no value you can come up with will ever make those. Non removable with this continuity at x equals zero. Okay? In other words, there's no way to define f of zero is to make the function continuous there. Okay, domain of g, remember g was the one, x squared minus one over x minus one. All real numbers except x equal one. Can't have it there, okay? Uh, but from theorem 2.3, which we just showed, you can conclude that g is continuous at every x value in its domain, but x equal 1 is not in the domain, okay? But that function, uh, if you do the, the math on this one like we did, back to the numerator and divide out, you'll find out it's uh, x plus 1, so that's why I'm, why I'm a line that goes through uh, y is equal to 1 here, it has a slope of 1, goes up here. Not defined there, but everywhere else is defined, okay? All you have to do is redefine or define a new value here. This is that everywhere except x equal 1, and x equal 1 lets you define it to be 2. And you can call it a Okay, so that is removable because you can define the value there. By defining g of 1 to be equal to 2, the redefined function is continuous for all real numbers. Okay. Now, the third one, the C one that we did, that's the one that was a piecewise defined function. 1 plus x, just like we had before, for all x is less than or equal to 0. For e to the x, for all values x greater than 0. But because if you did put a 0 in here, you would meet at the same point as this one. Now let's continue. It's not a whole. This is defined here, defined there. So I will get to this later. The slope is not defined at this point. Now it looks like it almost would be, but I don't think it is. Um, but this is continuous. All we're looking for now is continuous. Continuous on the entire number line. Find everywhere here, everywhere here, and the limit for the two will be one. And that's one, and that's one. Make sense? Didn't have to do a thing to that one. That was continuous everywhere. If that would have been x plus 2 on this end, and then e to the x here, no way to do all that. Okay. D. Which was D. Oh, yeah. D was your trig function, your sine function. And they go back and show you theorem 2.6 again. Uh, the domain of sine x is all real numbers. And since it is all real numbers, then the limit of x plus c of sine x is the sine c. So it's defined as a limit. No sweat anywhere. 
They throw the others in there too. This is defined everywhere. This is defined everywhere except it has pies. Okay? This is defined everywhere except your whole pie. This is defined everywhere except the half pies. This is defined everywhere except the whole pies. This is, as long as A is greater than zero, it's a positive number, this is defined everywhere. Exponential is just like this. Um, this is any base, any positive base, and E is a positive base. This one, what was the limitation here? See, be a real number in the domain. What's the limitation here? The log function. Say again? Okay, no, you're doing the uh, inverse of it, the Z. That's absolutely correct. Say again? It cannot be zero, is that what you said? Absolutely right. Anything else it can't be? Negative can't be any, can't be zero or any, has to be a positive value in. Positive value two. The domain of this is all positive numbers, not zero, not non negative numbers, all positive numbers. The log function starts down here and just keeps fine. Not, not defined at zero and never defined at negative. Now, what you're saying about e to the x, just think about it e to the x is like this. It's never negative. So its inverse function can't have an input that's ever negative. Okay? A great request for all uh, Identity function. Y is equal to x. All right. Good deal. Oh, here we go. Fromm theorem 2.6 that they were just showing. You can conclude that the function is continuous on the entire domain, negative infinity, positive infinity, because the sine function goes this direction. Forever and ever and ever, defined everywhere, no holes, no gaps, no discontinuities anywhere. Sine and cosine are continuous everywhere. The other four trig functions, everywhere they're defined, they're continuous, but at the half pies for tangent and uh, secant, at the whole pies for tangent. Anything is something over sine, discontinuous, discontinuous, discontinuous. And that would be cotangent and cosecant. Okay. Discontinuous at the whole pies. All right. That was example one, drawn out in gory detail. So we're moving on to page 96. Uh, in chapter 2, section 2.4, one-sided limits and continuity on a closed interval. Okay? Now, <clears throat> to understand continuity on a closed interval, you first need to look at a different type of limit called a one-sided limit. For instance, the limit from the right called the right-hand limit, means that as x approaches c from values greater than c, okay, like x coming in here, approaching c from the, from the right-hand side, that limit is denoted as the limit as x approaches c from the plus side, the right side, of f of x is equal to l. That would be the l value. Now, that illustration, this is work whether you have the plus there or not, okay? Because it's the same limit coming from the left. Okay? But this is how you define it from the right. Now, there's nothing that says this is uh, a closed interval. There's, I don't know really why they're making the distinction, the distinction now, but they are. Okay? You'll see it in a minute why they do. Okay? Similarly, the limit from the left as x is approaching c from the left, is that same value l, okay? Um, and this is how you denote that. The limit as x approaches c from the negative side of c, that means from the left of c, that's that same value l. And if those two limits are the same, you've got uh, 
this computer to continue serving. Okay, they haven't jumped to that yet, but that's where we're going. All right. One-sided limits are useful in taking limits for functions involving radicals. Because what's special about this, especially if your index is even? That n is even. Do you have any limitations on x? Take square root. Say again. X has to be non-negative. It doesn't have to be positive. It could be zero. Square root of zero is zero. Okay. So, but you can't even approach zero from the left-hand side because that's not defined from the left-hand side. So if you're approaching zero, if you're taking an even radical, even index radical, what's inside has to be, you do, do have a limit as it approaches from the right-hand side, you don't as it approaches from the left. Because it's not defined anywhere on the left. So that's why this one, a one-sided limit, is the only limit that makes sense. Okay. So let's do example two. Find the limit of f of x equal the square root of 4 minus x squared as x approaches minus 2 from the right. How do you reckon we're going to do that? What that is saying, find the limit of the square root of 4 minus x squared as x approaches negative 2 from the right, which means from the positive side. Okay? Anyone want to make a guess? Plug it in and see what you get. What do you get? Boy, you have to pull out your calculator on this one? Uh, hey? What you get? Okay, x is going to 4, but this is 4 minus 4. Say again? 0, and square root of 0 is? 0. Okay. Could x approach minus 2 from the left-hand side? What you think? x approach minus 2 from the left, say from minus 3, what would you get there? Again? Okay, what if, could x approach minus 2 from the minus side, from the left hand side? No. Why not? Yes, you get a negative number in the radical and you can't take it. And even n, which is just a square root, if you don't see an index there, understand it to be 2, square root of that, not going to happen. Not going to happen. So this is only, this is a one sided limit. Only from the right, not from the left. Okay. Now, let's see how they did it. I'll erase what I drew, drew so this is interfering a little bit. Now, what they did was draw the graph. I wish. I thought they were going to do that later. How would you go about drawing the graph of this? Back in the Pre-calculus days, and some of you I know were back there. Uh, what is f of x always? Another name for f of x. Y. y. Okay, let's change this. To be y is equal to the square root of four minus x squared. Now, how can you make that look a little nicer? Because I don't really like that square root symbol. It's really ugly. How do I undo that? 
square both sides. So what do you get? Y squared is equal to 4 minus X squared. Now, still don't quite look the way, like the way that looks because it has a variable on each side and a number on one side. How could you move that around and make it look a little nicer? We're all into appearance, right? Add X squared to both sides. And what do you have now? X squared plus Y squared is equal to 4. What does that... What do you think that is? Any of you familiar with that expression? A circle of radius R squared. Two. Okay. Well done. Okay, circle of radius 2. Okay, so this, oh, a circle centered at the origin of radius 2 because it's x minus 0, y minus 0 squared. Okay, so that would be a circle of radius 2 centered at the origin. Okay, now let's go back to this. Notice it's not, it doesn't include any negative numbers because the radical by itself is the principal square root. So just ignore this. So that's how they got the graph to be that. Okay? Now that's probably not how they did it, but that's one way to think of doing it. So that is a semicircle. Positive only because this means the principal square root and it goes like this. You know it's a circle focus. You did what we did. We did that. Up of x is y. Okay. Now, the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right is indeed 0. x can't even approach it from the left because x is not defined out here. This would be a circle, and that's all it could ever be. So it has no values here or here. But it is a closed interval. Notice how those dots are solid dots. So it is a closed interval. So that does approach to negative 2 from the right. How about positive 2? One-sided or two-sided? There's not a limit. What you get there? Say again? And from where? So x is approaching 2 from the left-hand side, 2 from the minus side. So if you took off the minus here, then you put in the minus there. Good deal. Okay. One-sided limits can be used to investigate the behavior of step functions. You all know what step functions are? Functions that are defined different intervals in different ways. Okay. Um, one common type of step function, they love this one, by the way, is the greatest integer function, which is that double bracket around x or whatever your function is in there. And that's defined as the greatest integer n such that n is less than, or, thank you, less than or equal to x. Okay? Uh, so what would be the greatest integer in 2.5? integer that's less than or equal to 2.5. Anybody? Two. Two. Okay, very good. How about this one? Negative 2.5. Negative, I agree with that one. Negative what? Okay. Now, is negative 2 less than negative 2.5? No, what you think? Think of your number line, okay? If it's less than, it's got to be on that side, okay? And 
for this one, if you're too close out to, to the left, what's the next energy you get? Two. But here, if you're at negative 2.5, look to your left, because that would be less than equal to, what's the next energy you get? Negative two. So that's why they want to two. So there's your greatest energy function. Okay? Now here's the graph of it. Oh, yeah. Okay. When the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, the... Did they skip something here? I'm not been turning the pages as well as I should have. That was example four, which we just did, wasn't it? No, that was example two. Ah, example three they skipped. Okay. They jump here to one-sided limits. Uh, no. Yeah, no, that's correct. Okay. Then here, they jump to the top of page 97. Okay. So to get example 3 in, bottom of 96, let's go back down to here. Let's do example 3. Find the limit of the greatest integer function, f of x equal greatest integer in x. Okay, something like that. I don't draw these symbols well. Okay? As x approaches 0 from the left and from the right. Okay. Do you find that helpful to graph the function first, or do you want to just think through it? Say again? Okay. We want the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x. I'll just write it f of x. Okay, and we want the limit as x approaches 0 from the right. This time I'll write what it is of f of value. I mean, not f of value, greatest integer in x. I should have written that up there too, but I already wrote that. You want to think through this? Or do you want to just think you need to graph? Graphs certainly help you see it better, but... Huh? You want the graph? Okay. So how does the greatest integer function look? Okay. There's my y-axis. Here's my x-axis. Let's tick off a few points. Okay. How would you begin graphing that? I'd say, give me an X. I feel like a cheerleader, right? Say again? One? Is that what you said? Okay. What is the absolute, uh, greatest integer in one? Say again? One. Okay, good. Okay. Give me another X. Two. What's the greatest integer in, in two? Two. Okay, got it. Next one? Say again? Three. Three. All right, y'all are real creative here, aren't you? Okay. Three, okay. Negative one. What's the greatest integer in negative one? Negative one. All right. Next. Negative two. Oh, I thought I almost could smell that one coming. Okay. Four. Oh, okay. Jump again on a rabbit here. Okay. Y'all got the easy ones here. Let's get something not an integer, okay? Well, let's just throw in the one you're missing. Which integer are you missing? Zero is going to be zero, right? All right. Now, all right. Let's pick something not an integer. Give me an X. Say again. 2.7. All right. 2.7 is right here. What's the greatest integer in 2.7? Two. Okay, so that would be right about here. Can you fill in any blanks for me? Everywhere from 2 to 2.7 up to 3. But when you get to 3, it jumps up here. And when you get 3 to the right, it's going to be 3 until it gets to 4, and then it jumps up here. And then it'll be 
here to the right until it gets to 5, and then it jumps up here. How about back this way? Be 1 to the right until it gets to 2. Here it'll be. Okay, down here is negative 1, okay. Be negative 1 till you get to 0, and then you jump up here. And then 0 until you get here. Negative 2 until you get here. You see the pattern? Okay. Now, the question was, what's the limit as x approaches 0 from the left-hand side? What's your limit? x is approaching 0 from the left, coming in this way. What's your value down here? Negative 1. So this will be negative 1. What's the limit of that as x approaches 0 from the right-hand side? 0. Perfect. Okay. Is this function continuous everywhere? No. Not even everywhere in its domain, because it has discontinuities at every energy. So it's not a replaceable discontinuity either. It is a discontinuity. Okay. Does that kind of make sense? All right. Now, to me that's not a very practical illustration of the step function. Are there any? Have you ever mailed a letter? Yeah, probably. Okay. Now, if it was a big old, okay, if it was a, just a normal, maybe one or two, maybe even three-page letter, then probably was whatever the forever stamp is. Now, I don't, I don't even know what first-rate postage is now. Let's just say 48 cents. It may be greater. I don't know. Okay? Whatever it is. But what if it's more than an ounce? Then you have to pay another level. That's a stepwise function. Now, that one has the open circle on this end. Let's say this represents 48 cents up here. Now, you don't have a letter that has zero mass, right? You just can't have it. That's, that's free. If you don't have any weight, you, you don't have to put it on there. Okay. But if it's anything up to an ounce, it's going to be this. And but in an ounce, you put a solid circle there because you can still get by with that 48 cents. But then once it exceeds an ounce, you jump up here to whatever the next one is and open a circle here and you go solid circle. Open a circle. That's, right. That's a very practical illustration of the two part of the front part. And near the twain will meet. You press discontinuous. In the early days of cell phones and things like this, they had minutes. Oh, you remember that, huh? So many minutes, you paid a certain rate, but if you get past that, you then went to a higher rate, or maybe a lower rate, I don't know, but a different rate, okay? So those were piecewise functions, okay? What was it, 100 minutes, 400 minutes, something like that. And then some of them have date, different limits for data and and Remember all that mess. Nowadays, they're a lot simpler, I think. I hope. My wife pays that bill. I don't even pay attention to it. Okay. All right. But these are examples of piecewise defined functions. So, that was example three. Negative one for approaching from the left. Zero for approaching from the right. Now, I think we're ready for the top of the page. 97. When a limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right, the two-sided limit does not exist. Okay? The next theorem makes this more explicit. <coughs> this is for the limit. Let L be a function. Let C and L be any two real numbers. The limit of F of X as X approaches C is L is equal to that L if and only if the limit as X approaches C from the left of F of X 
is L, and the limit as x approaches C from the right of L plus x is L. Remember our x plus 1, and these are the x, that limit was 1 here, it was 1 here. So yes, that limit is 1. Okay? If they're not, then two different values, non-renewable, removable discontinuity. Okay. Does that make sense? Our greatest integer function, your postage, whatever. All right. The concept of a one-sided limit allows you to extend the definition of continuity to closed intervals. And this is why they were always focusing on closed intervals. Basically, a function is continuous on a closed interval when it's continuous in the interior of that interval and exhibits one-sided continuity at the endpoint. So this is stated formally in this definition. Okay? Function f is continuous on the closed interval a to b when f is continuous on the open interval a to b, so it continues everywhere in the middle, and the limit as x approaches a from the right-hand side, the limit of f of x is f of a, and the limit as x approaches b from the left-hand side of f of x is f of b, then this would be uh, continuous on the closed interval. The function is continuous from the right, a continues from the left at B. So in other words, no. If this was a value down here, no. Or this up here or down here, or anywhere other than there and there, then this would this is continuous from the closed interval A to B. Remember our earlier one, we always had open circles here, and we only talked about the interval. Okay. So let's discuss the continuity of this function b. Hopefully that looks a little familiar, doesn't it? What would that represent? What does that kind of look like that we did not too long ago? Say again? It's a semicircle, exactly, of radius. Say again? Radius 1. Because remember, the other was 4 minus x squared. It was radius 2. This is 1 minus x squared. That's radius 1. So this would be a semicircle like this. So what's its continuity? From... Minus 1 to plus 1. Inclusive, that whole interval, because the it approaches 0 as x approaches <laughs> negative 1 from the left, not from the right, but from the, from the right, not from the left, and as x approaches positive 1 from the left, but not from the right, it approaches 0 again. So that would be continuous from negative 1 to positive 1. Okay? Can't be outside that. Okay. The domain of F is the closed interval, negative 1 to positive 1. At all points on the open interval, negative 1 to 1, the continuity follows from the previous theorem that um, the even root of an expression here, as long as the x is greater than or equal to zero, so your expression here is one minus x squared. Well, that greater than zero from any time x is greater than or equal to zero, any time x is from negative one to one. Any x outside that, that's going to be that negative in there. So that works. And let's say, oh, and this is the composite function thing, which I was just doing without thinking about it. The g of x is 1 minus x squared. Uh, and you, that's what I just said. 1 minus x squared is, the, is positive anywhere from minus 1 to 1. Or non-negative anywhere from minus 1 to 1. 
the call to rat and then the uh, 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 Yes. Which one? Which one? The Okay. I don't think we called that one sided, did we? Okay, let me get this out of the way. Okay, all we were saying here was what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative 2 from the right. We weren't talking about sidedness at all here. Okay, we were just saying what's its limit. Because if it was 0, then that made it defined on the, on the closed interval. So, but we hadn't defined what we meant by that yet. They were just showing it. So yeah. It doesn't contradict it, I don't think. <clears throat> okay. All right. We didn't get this far before. Moreover, because the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the positive side is 0, which is f of negative 1, and x approaches 1 from the positive 1 from the negative side, it's also 0, which is f of 1. Let me plug in a 1 there. Uh, you see that the, it's defined at the endpoint, and the limit is a value at the endpoint. So it's continuous there. Okay. So that makes the closed interval continuous. Now. That was example four. Before we get to the properties of continuity, we have example five to go. Now, let's do example five here. How are we doing on time? You got what? It's 11 18. So we've got, oh yeah, 20 minutes. 22 minutes. Okay. Now, Example 5 here says, this is dealing with Charles's law, uh, I'm the law, remember that, uh, no, okay. uh, an absolute zero. On the Kelvin scale, absolute zero is the temperature 0K. Well, this sounds more like physics than it does math, but it's a very good application here. Although temperature very close to zero have been produced in laboratories, Absolute zero has never been attained. In fact, evidence suggests that absolute zero cannot be attained. Okay? Um, now, any of you in your physics class? Yep. Okay, you are. Physics one or two? One. Okay. I think when you get to physics 2, you'll get thermodynamics. I think that's what those folks are doing right now. Because I had one of them in a Cal 3 class, I guess. No, I can't remember. I had some somewhere. Okay? In thermodynamics, there were originally three laws of thermodynamics, basically done by William Thompson, who was the primary architect of them. And does anyone know anything about William Thompson? He was a rare bird. He was a brilliant scientist, but he was also landed aristocracy. He was a lord in the British Empire. Very seldom did you have very bright people. No, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Did I? Okay, uh, rare thing. And guess what the title of his lordship was? Lord Calvin. That's why they named this after him, okay? Not after his name. We don't call it the Thompson scale. We call it the Kelvin scale after his title. Now, I'm not sure he was the only one doing this, but others did it as well. But he came up with the theory. But the third law of thermodynamics is absolute zero can be approached but never reached. That is the third law. So far, we found that to be true. We can get close, really close, but so far, 
no one's gotten there, and theoretically, they can't. Now, back when he came up with that, his reasoning, the, the conclusion seemed like it was right, but his reasoning was wrong. Here was what the reasoning was. Uh, I'll give you the example here, so we may not get to this. Guy. Charles's Law says that when you uh, decrease the temperature of a volume of gas at a constant pressure, the volume will decrease. Have y'all experienced that before? Have you ever left a soccer ball or a basketball or some other ball outside in the cold overnight? Mm -hmm. And you come out and you think, oh, it's going flat. Mm -hmm. Take it inside, let it warm up, and it's perfectly fine. Right? Same thing is true with your tires. Don't check your air tire pressure when you've just been driving 500 miles in the summertime or a hot pay test. That's not the time to check your tires. That's cold temperature, okay? That's Charles's law. Here's what they did. Somebody did. May have been possible. Somebody did. They took a gas, known gas, and they had it at a known temperature here and measured its water temperature, okay? At that temperature. Then they dropped the temperature, but at the same pressure, the volume dropped from here. And then here, and then here, and then here. At some point, it kept getting colder and colder and colder. At some point, though, the gas became a liquid. But that formed almost a straight line. Okay. Now, they were probably using the Celsius temperature scale. I don't know for sure if I'm guessing that. That got them way below zero before that gas became a liquid. So it was somewhere way down there. Well, they took another gas, and it made it here. And lo and behold, all the guesses they did, they noticed even though they had different volumes at the same temperature, when they lowered the temperature, they all headed toward the same point. The slope was different, but they all were, if you extrapolated, they came to the same point. They all became liquids before they got there, but they were all headed to the same point. That point they called absolute cold as you can go, because the gases didn't even get there. They went into a liquid first. So they said that's as cold as you can go. You can approach it, but never reach it. That was their stuff. Now, here's what their original thought was. They thought that was true because they said absolute zero all motion would stop. And they would collapse. There's no use fire. But, when quantum mechanics came along, they said, no, it's it reaches its minimum energy state. And I guess, theoretically, that can never be reached. Motion does nev never stop till it reaches its lowest energy state. So, that's what I said there. Conclusion seemed to be right, but their explanation wasn't quite correct. All right, but anyway, that was what's happening. Charles's Law, absolute zero. Okay? How do scientists determine that 0K is a lower limit of the tem temperature of matter? And what is zero on the Celsius scale? Um, frankly, I don't see a whole lot of math here except what I was just describing. The determination of absolute zero stems from the work of French physicist Jacques Charles. Charles, okay. That's why it's called Charles's Law, it's not mine. Um, 1786 to 1823, he lived about the time of the birth of the country, this country, uh, uh, which was a really rough time in France, too. What was going on in France during that interval? The what? 1746 to 1823. What followed our revolution fairly closely? The French Revolution. Ours you know, was bloody enough, but it was nothing like the French Revolution. Remember the guillotine? You know, ooh, that was a messy, messy time. Okay, uh, King lost his head. No, he went not. Oh no, 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 okay. But anyway, he discovered how he lived through it. That's really incredible. Okay, he discovered the volume of gas at constant temperature 
at constant pressure increases linearly with temperature of the gas, which also decreases with the, as the temperature drops. And they did the table here, uh, and since it's not on here, uh, this is going to be heavy. All right, and this is what they did. At the 80 degrees Celsius, which is very hot, 60, to, this is room temperature here, there's the volume. See, the volume keeps decreasing as the temperature decreases. Zero is the freezing point of water, so that's that minus 20 is really, really cold, minus 40. Somewhere past there, it probably goes to the liquid. Uh, well, I don't know, it may go even further. I don't know what gas you use. But anyway, that points toward a point down here. Okay? Uh, it couldn't quite reach there, though. Of course, certainly the gas was just on the liquid before that. Uh, but the points represent, and this graph represent that. They don't even come close to absolute zero, but they're heading that direction. And they're heading in a very linear manner. That was Charles's law. Okay? Um, now, so what they do, they come up with a linear equation, and they don't say how they did it. I don't know if they did it with uh, linear regression, or they just use these numbers and said they were accurate enough to use it. But anyway, seems like a lot of exercise and utility is in this. What you get if you carry through all that effort, you come up with the limit of speed approach as V approach to zero from the positive side that temperature would be minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, okay? Most of the time they just round up to minus 273. But you can't approach it anyway. You can't reach it anyway. Why not put it, put a nice whole number just below that, okay? So that would be zero on the Kelvin scale. Okay. Do you think it's worth it going through all those numbers? You can do it if you want to. It's just a little on the messy side, but it's, it's certainly doable. Uh, but anyway, by the way, since Jacques Charles was mentioned here, he's a potential paper topic. So his paper will probably be a bit more physics than math. Please excuse, include some math on it. All right. So let's, I think, let's just move on to principles of continuity. How are we doing on time? Properties of continuity. It's what? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. So let's do properties of continuity. And right to the, let me see. Okay. Just to the left of this, you see somebody else's picture. Augustine Louis Cauchy. I believe he's French as well. So it sounds like it. Um, but the concept of continuous function, first introduced by this young-looking guy here, um, if you look at the years that he lived, he lived to be a fairly old guy, so definitely he did this fairly early on, like in his 30s. <laughs> no, yeah, 30s. The definition given in his context, uh, course of analysis, I guess, stated that the indefinite and small changes in Y result in infinite and small changes in X, and F of X is a continuous function, blah, blah, blah. If you want to write on him, this little blurb here is not your source. Where the blurb came from, if you can find a, uh, a source for this, you can use it. Like I said, the book's a great idea for paper topics, but it can't be the source for your paper. Source of ideas, but not paper. So anyway, here is Theorem 2.11, Properties of Continuity. If B is a real number, any old real number, f and g are continuous at x equals c, then the functions listed below are also continuous at c. So, multiply either one of these continuous functions by or any real number, that's called scalar multiplication, 
that will also be a continuous function. No matter how big or how small that B is, whether it's positive or negative, rational or irrational, whatever, you multiply a real number by a continuous function, it makes a new continuous function. Also, if you have the sum or the difference of two continuous functions, that sum or difference will also be a continuous function. Or if you have a product of two continuous functions, the product will also be a continuous function. Here's a little caveat here. The quotient of two continuous functions will be a continuous function as long as that bottom function, g of c, and this is at point c, as long as that g of c is not zero. That g of c is zero, all bets are off the right. Okay. So, getting a multiple of a function, it continue, of a continuous function, it continues. The sum or a difference of, a of two continuous functions are continuous. The product of two continuous functions is continuous. And the quotient of two continuous functions is continuous at a point C as long as the G of C is not zero. Okay. Just as you would expect, I hope. Okay? Now this leads to a summary here, which I've already been saying. Now that leads to this. A polynomial, any, any, any polynomial function is continuous because guess what? X is continuous. X raised to the power is continuous, multiplied by a constant is continuous, and sums are added to other things that are continuous. So all polynomial functions, all polynomial functions are continuous every place. We've already been saying that. Rational functions, as long as that Q of X, the one in the denominator, is not equal to zero for any value of X. Okay? For the value of X in place. R of x is continuous for all values of x as long as that x doesn't make the denominator zero. Okay? Radical functions. Okay? Radical functions are continuous everywhere. Okay, remember how we did this? If n was odd, they're continuous everywhere. If n is even, they're only continuous for x is not negative. Greater than x is zero. Trigonometric functions, sine and cosine, are continuous. Okay, here's how they get away with it, without saying too much, at every point in their domain. Polynomial domain is all real numbers. Rational functions are, are domain anywhere the denominator is not zero. Okay, so anywhere that the domain. The domain of this is all positive numbers if n is even. Non-negative numbers is in even all numbers if n is odd. And the trig functions, what are their domains? All real numbers, all real numbers, all real numbers not half size, all real numbers not whole size, all real numbers not half size, and all real numbers not whole size. So they weasel around it by saying at every point in their domain. They just don't tell you what the domain is. Now exponential logarithmic functions. All real numbers, as long as that A is positive. A can't be um, negative, and A can't be, by the way, 0 or 1. Usually they don't let A be 1 either. So for all A's other than that, for every X value, that's for the all real numbers, for the X. A's are limited, but the X is not. E to the X. That's a number not one, not zero, not negative. But yeah, that's good. Everywhere. It's all real values X. But log X, everything in its domain, but what is the domain of log X? Say again? Greater than zero. Not greater than or equal to greater than zero. Absolutely. So by combining the theorem we just had with this list, you can conclude that a wide variety of elementary functions are continuous at every point in their domain. And elementary functions are basically those. The early transcendental functions are basically these. Okay? Now, 
Uh, theorem 211, this is example 6, we have time for it. How, what's that? Five minutes. Yeah, thank you. On theorem 211, it follows that each of the functions below is continuous here. At every point in its domain, there is a kit. Okay? What would be a second? I don't tell you what to do with this, but I'll tell you what. Uh, what is the domain of those two functions? All real numbers. This is a polynomial function. That's an exponential function. They're both continuous everywhere, so their sum will be continuous everywhere. How about this one? Say again. I mean, no sums of this are I know. All except the half pies, okay? One half pie, three half pies, and I'm not two half pies, that's one pie, okay? So not that one. All of the pure half pies, uh, half pie, three half pies, five half pies, negative half pie, negative half pie. All of those, this will be continuous because it's a uh, constant number multiplied by a, a uh, function that's continuous to all values in its domain with this one. Okay. How about that? Okay, all x over cosine is equal to zero, and where is cosine is equal to zero? You what? Your half pi is again. You're absolutely right. That's what made tangent half pi, because the tangent is sine of the cosine. Cosine of the denominator is two to all the half pi. This is continuous everywhere. That's a polynomial function. This is continuous everywhere. Fine. However, this is also zero someplace. Now, here's a question. What if we had flipped those two? Where would that be continuous? Or would it? Well, x squared plus 1 is not equal to 0. Is x squared plus 1 ever equal to 0? No, because x squared could be 0, but it can't be negative. Add 1 to 0 or positive number, it's never going to be 0. So yeah, if you flip that, that would be continuous everywhere. As written here, no, not continuous there. I don't know if that's what they were looking for. Let's see if we can find it. This is example six. Uh, oh, okay. This is a completely different thing. <laughs> All they said, these are continuous everywhere in the domain. Duh. That's not much of an example, is it? It is, I guess, but you didn't have to do anything. We <laughs> did it ad nauseum, perhaps. Okay. All right. Are we out of time? Okay. So we'll be beginning at bottom of page 99 next time. And let's see, this is a fairly long section. Well, we don't have too much more to go. Homework exercises here. You can do any of the odds, 5 through 9. They're all at Calc Chat. 5's at Calc View. Any of the odds 11 through, goodness gracious, 29, 31, they're all account chat, 11's account view. Any of the odds 33 to th either 33 or 35, both account chat, 33's account view. 37 or 39, both account chat, 37's account view. Uh, 41 through 59, they're all account chat, 47 is a count view. Any of the odds 61 to 65, all at count chat, 61 is a count view. Is that about where we stop? Yeah, let's stop somewhere in there. If you want to do a few more, Tom, but you know, we'll pick up the rest of those next time. All right. Any questions? Ooh, this is a 
These homework exercises, that some goes up to 132. So you certainly don't have to do all of them, but do enough so you feel comfortable. Yeah, I got this. And go for it. It's usually more than zero. Okay, so do something. All right, any questions?